We were here last week. I'm not going to particularly go through the, the context within what we have just read or the book of Ephesians because um, in our morning service, um, Nabil did such a great job of painting the context out for us and then Richard did that as well at the 6 p.m. if you were here last week. But what you do need to know is that this passage that we have just read together sits within this kind of wider train of thought that Paul has in chapters one to three where he talks about the incredible theology of the gospel that culminates in Christ Jesus. And as, as Alison was reading there, I'm sure you could hear just the immense, immense theology and immense truth that we were all receiving. So that's what happens in chapters one to three of Ephesians. And then there's a bit of a shift as we'll see as we continue on in our series. In chapters four to six then take this shift where it's like, okay, this is the theology. This is almost the head and the heart knowledge. But then how do we live this out as followers of Jesus. So I'm really excited for what this series will bring and I hope you are too. When I like to preach, I was telling the 10.30 this morning, I'm a bit of a devil's advocate by personality. I like to ask questions. And so a question is hopefully gonna come up on the screen that I just wanna frame some of our thoughts around. And that question is, what is your identity? What is your identity? I don't know about you, but Names carry so much power, don't they? What we're named, what we're called, they carry so much power. And I don't know what it's like over here, but for me in school in Northern Ireland, it's just like once you had a nickname, it stuck. <laughs> so a bit of a story for you. Back when I was at school, um, I wasn't really that much of a sports person. You can probably kind of tell. But <laughs> it's either really you choose music or you choose sport. And I chose to be in the choir, and that was okay. Walking past everybody, lifting their weights with my wee man bag, walking past to the choir. It was awesome. But anyway, one of the times that I did try PE and played football, and I'm all right. I sometimes show up on a Tuesday night. I'm okay. But one of the times that I did show up at PE, I forgot my trainers, okay? So I had everything on me, the entire PE kit, but was just flumping around in these awful black school shoes. One of the guys went, huh, shoes, it stuck. So my name from then on was shoes. <laughs> so my point is that names do stick. I don't know what you place your identity in. Maybe you place your identity in what you do or those around you, but as a follower of Jesus, really your question becomes, who does Jesus say that I am? What does the Bible say about me? And if you've walked in tonight and you don't know Jesus, I wanna encourage you, please get to know him. This is an incredible adventure. You won't always be able to make sense of it, but please don't switch off, because even though I'm gonna talk about our identity in Jesus, there's something for you too if you don't believe in Jesus tonight. So the three areas that I want to talk about and they're going to come up on screen as we move through this passage together are the significance of the gospel or the significance of what Jesus has done for us, both on the cross and in rising from the dead. And then maybe answering that question, what does Jesus say about us? And then if that's what the significance of the gospel holds for us and that's what Jesus says about us, well then, what is the application point? What are we gonna do about it? Up for that? Brilliant, awesome. So firstly, talking about the significance of the gospel, and this passage is, is incredible. It's littered with so much incredible truth of what we celebrate and what we know as Christians. But I'm just gonna pick out a few things. Just turn with me if you do have your Bibles to chapter two, the second part of what Alison read. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Verse four says, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. 
even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. This does not come from us. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And just really quickly, I just want to pick up on some of the incredible points that we see here in this passage. It's not all of them in the book of Ephesians, like I said, especially in those first three chapters. Please go read it because it's just incredible good news of the gospel. So if we dive into some of the Greek terminology, for those of you that don't know, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and sometimes it can help us, not always, but sometimes it can help us and paint a little bit of a bigger picture of what's going on in this passage So take a look at this phrase with me in verse two. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. The original Greek word for this is nekros. I got everybody to say this this morning. See if you're better at them. Can everybody say nekros after three? One, two, three. Yeah, they were better. Um, (laughs) Savage. Anyway, um, you you guys were great. Um, So this word nekros really kind of means what it, what, it, what really what we would translate it as. It's deceased, okay? But in other translations for it are departed or someone who is gone. And then jump down with me and contrast this with verse four. It says, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. And in contrast, this Greek word, it's actually two Greek words. We don't really have kind of such a little literal translation for it in our English language. It literally translates as make alive together with. But it's made up of these two Greek words, which are really hard to pronounce. You wouldn't understand it in my accent. It wouldn't even work. But in English, scholars say that it's very close to, it kind of gives the connotations of this word in our language, reanimate reanimate. It's incredible imagery and contrast just in those two verses alone. Then we continue to read on in verse six, we read that we are raised up together. The closest meaning again of this is to rise from death and that we are seated with him, which is one Greek word, which means to sit in company with. And just look at that incredible imagery for me for a moment. Isn't that amazing? Just that the imagery in this passage that we can see is that we were, we were gone. <laughs> we were actually physically gone, that our life previous to when you knew Jesus was going nowhere. Life without Jesus goes nowhere. Leading nowhere, you were gone, spiritually dead. But then God reaches in and reanimates you to life. But not only that, that's not where the gospel ends, and this is incredible. Not only did Jesus come back to raise us to life again, to give us eternal life, but we read that he raises us up and that he seats us in company, not only with himself, but with the entire heavenly realms. I hope that that is incredibly good news to you today. Continuing on then, secondly, what does he say about us? If that's the significance of the gospel, what does he say about us? And I'm going to move quite quickly because, yeah, I want to get to ministry and stuff. And I'm going to kind of try to introduce a bit of a point that I didn't talk about this morning, which is controversial, but you'll be blessed. It'll be great. What does Jesus say about us? Chapter 1, verse 18, if you read, it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And verse 19 says, and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. And two or three really interesting things that we can pick up hear about what this passage reveals to us about our identity. And guys, this isn't just what the Bible says about you, not just in this passage. It says so much more about who you are, but there's really a few incredible things that we can read about what your identity is in Jesus. Verse 18 speaks of a glorious inheritance, the eternal blessedness of the consummated kingdom of God, which is to be expected after the visible return of Christ. The Greek word for this kind of word inheritors is kleronomia. 
And one of the commentators that I was reading said that it's almost like a shareholder. I was saying to the 10.30 this morning that I've never had, held shares in my life. I'm not intelligent enough to do that or financially incompetent competent enough to do that. I did get offered shares in a brewery once, which is very Irish, but I didn't take them. Interestingly, somebody came up to me today after the service and went, it wouldn't happen to be Boundary Brewery, would it? And I was like, yeah, it was. So they knew what it was which I don't know whether that was embarrassing or not. So anyway, <laughs> so you are shareholders in the kingdom of God. Verse 18 tells you that you are shareholders in the kingdom of God. The second part of that verse calls you a holy people, or some translations say you are saints. If you are in Christ, he no longer views your identity. You are not seen as a sinner, but you are seen as a saint. Chapter 2, verse 10, calls you God's handiwork, or some translations say God's workmanship, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And then verse 19, if you want to come back to chapter 1, verse 19, says, and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. If you call Jesus your savior, if you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you have resurrection power inside of you. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. So on screen, just begin to speak that over yourself. Now and today, you are inheritors or shareholders of the kingdom of heaven. You are saints, not sinners. You're God's handiworker, his workmanship. And you are people with resurrection power inside of you. And I was sharing this morning with the 1030, you know, does, we live in this tension, don't we, where even though that is what our heavenly identity is, even though that's what our identity in Jesus is, does that mean that we forget where we have come from? No, we don't. And I love tonight that Abraham started with a practice of confession because it's so important for us that confession is in the rhythm of what we do as church. Because actually, much like our Jewish brothers and sisters that valued remembrance, we need to remember and exercise the practice of remembrance, of remembering what we have been saved from. Verse 8 says, for it is by grace that you have been saved, saved through faith. This has nothing to do with us. This is a gift. Nicola and I were at a conference um, earlier on in the week. It was actually quite funny. His name is Lecrae, but Nicola said Lecree this morning, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. Um, <laughs> we didn't correct you. It was great. I really enjoyed it. It was so funny. Does anybody know who Lecrae is? Yeah. Um, so he's basically this rapper, and um, I was, I'm not going to lie, I was kind of nervous whenever he got up to preach, because I didn't, I didn't say this to anybody, I haven't said this until, until now, but I, I actually worked with him not long before at a, at a festival, a Christian festival back home, and he was a bit of a diva, sorry Lecrae if you're watching, but when he took, when he took to the, <laughs> why would he be, uh, when, he <laughs> when he took to the pulpit, I was like, oh, what is going to happen here, but he, but he actually preached an incredible message, and he talked about this tension that we live in, when this is our identity, and we have been saved, but actually we still mess up and we still wrestle and we're still becoming holy. And he said this amazing thing where he said, it takes an instant to pull someone out of slavery, but it takes a lifetime to bring slavery out of someone. It takes an instant to pull someone out of slavery, but it takes a lifetime to bring slavery out of something. This is your identity, guys, but it is also so important that we continually remember what we have been saved from. But hold fast to that today. So lastly, what are we going to do about it? What are we gonna do about it? Chapter two, verse 10 says that we are God's handiwork, workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And the message 
has this incredible translation and way of terming it where he says, no, we neither make nor save ourselves. This has nothing to do with us. God does both the making and saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do. And I love this work we had better be doing. Doesn't seem like it's an optional clause that we get out of telling people about Jesus. We need to not only know that we, yes, here, gathered tonight, are alive, but we need to let everybody know out there that they can be too. And I was praying. In, during the week of like, what, what do you guys as a 6 p.m. congregation need to hear? What is it that you guys need to hear? Prayed this over the 10.30 as well. And I just felt the Lord say in my preparation, I feel like some of us struggle to tell others about Jesus because we are getting up in the morning and clothing ourselves with the wrong identity. We're struggling to tell others about Jesus because we are clothing ourselves in the wrong identity. Let me explain a little bit about what I'm talking about. Colossians, Paul also wrote a letter to the church in Colossae, Colossae, yes? One of those pronunciations, that'll do. (laughs) That was good, (laughs) very good. Anyway, so in Colossians 3, Colossians chapter 3, which interestingly in our Bibles is titled as living as those made alive in Christ. So this is how we are made alive in Christ and how we live that out. It says, since then, and this won't come up on screen, since then you have been raised with Christ. This is what a cross-reference and kind of Paul's letters talk to each other a lot. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And then it goes on to list all these things that we need to put to death as followers of Jesus, like sexual immorality, impurity, evil desires, idolatry, and greed. But the emphasis is on that you used to walk in these ways. Then verse nine says, do not lie to each other since you've taken off off your old self with its practice and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. And then hopping down to verse 12, it says, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, there's more identity, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And I know that it's a bit of a deviation from Ephesians, but like I said, Paul's letters share themes across them. And I just felt like there are some of us in this room that are getting up in the morning and clothing ourselves in the wrong identity. Verse 12 says, clothe yourself. There is a responsibility on us as followers of Jesus to clothe ourselves with the identity that has been given to us. Joe, could you come help me out a wee sec? So, you stand right here. Look at him, he's a beautiful man. It's great. So I don't know about you, but I wake up in the morning or life hits me hard or people speak stuff over me and I start to wear labels. Clothe myself in labels that I shouldn't. Like shame. People love this phrase actually in Northern Ireland. Controversially, some preachers would still call you a dirty, rotten sinner. Maybe you get up in the morning and you put on the clothes of anger. Maybe you think that you're worthless. Joe, this isn't what I'm speaking over you, bro, by the way. Um, Just let you know you're great. You clothe yourself with worry. You put on the clothes of malice and gossip, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until what begins to happen is that you have clothed yourself in an identity that is not yours. That is not what Jesus calls you. It's gone, it's gone now. Um, 
And a wise person once said to me that in repentance, what happens when we carry this stuff over us, which inevitably happen in our lives, we are sinful still, but we are not, that is not our nature anymore. That is not our identity. What happens when the Holy Spirit comes along is he does not condemn, he convicts and he corrects. See, the language of the enemy whenever we go through this stuff is, look at what you did. Look at what you did. You should be better. But the language of a loving father that has made you alive says, that's not who you are anymore. Thanks, Joe. And I just want to encourage you guys tonight. I really felt that if we are to fully walk as God's workmanship into our spheres of influence, into this society, if we want to see change in this community, then actually let's start with tonight and do a bit of a reset on really what our identity is in Jesus and Christ. For some of you, you need to take off those labels. You need to clothe yourself and the identity that Jesus has given you. Because the thing is, if we actually continually clothe ourselves with these labels, then we will begin to act in these ways. That's what happens. A friend of mine once said, what you focus on, you move towards. So if you clothe yourself in shame, you will operate as a shameful person. If you get up in the morning and you clothe yourself with anger, you will continue to be angry. But if you accept the grace that has been given to you, and let me be clear, this is not of us whatsoever. This is a gift, as Ephesians has told us. But if we choose to clothe ourselves in the identity that Jesus has given us, I believe that something incredibly powerful can happen. And I want to give space for us tonight because I really believe that there are some of us in this room and you've been clothing yourself with lies, accepting lies, and not accepting the truth of who Jesus says that you are. Shall we stand? I'm just going to invite the band back up now as we just wait.